The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So last time we were starting more complicated mechanisms, and we uh, looked at uh, series reactions. A goes to B, which is an intermediate, goes to C, where the rates K1 and K2. And we, we um, did the, <clears throat> we solved the problem exactly, which turned out to be a little bit complicated. And then we were looking at um, special cases. And I left the special case of K1 equals K2 to do as a homework problem. And then on the board, we did K1 much greater than K2, which uh, looks like if K1 is much greater than K2, the rate into K1 is much greater than K2. So using the analogy of, of, of buckets and, and um, pipes, it's a, a big pipe between K1 and between A and B and a little pipe between B and C, and you start with a bunch of liquid on top, and you basically dump it into, into, into here, and then you slowly drip into C here. So the first thing that happens is that A gets dumped and becomes B very quickly with a rate constant K1 in a first order, first order fashion. So A is A naught e to the minus k1 times time. Then b comes up sharply and then drops down with uh, <coughs> rate constant k2 slowly. So b is approximately a naught e to the minus k2 times time. And then c has a very small quadratic rise followed by uh, the exponential rise to saturation that you'd expect. So C is approximately A naught times 1 minus E to the minus K2 times time. The rate constant K2 dominates the long times, and everything is looking like it's pseudo first order at long times. So you can do this either by thinking about it, you can solve the problem by thinking about it, which is perfectly fine, or you can do it by solving it exactly as we have uh, done last time, and then putting in the right approximations which is in this case was a Taylor's approximation, if I remember right. And uh, no, just by looking at the, uh, the equation and putting the right approximation, you get it out. And the third approximation, which is the opposite one, K2 much less than K1, so K1 much less than K2, the way that that's going to look You can do it by inspection. So basically, if we think of buckets and pipes, that's a very thin pipe connecting the bucket for A and B. So we drip from A to B. Then we have this very fat pipe connecting B and C. So as soon as a little B gets in there, it immediately becomes C. right? So the rate determining step is the first one, A goes to B. And so K1, we expect that to be the rate that dominates the long time. And, um, and we never expect to get any significant amount of B to pile up in the middle bucket because this pipe is much bigger than that one here. So therefore, what we expect to see is a slow decay in A with rate constant K1 dominating the long times. A is approximately A naught e to the minus K1 times the time. Um, we don't expect B to amount to very much at all. It'll rise up a little bit at the very early times, and it'll pretty much stay very, very small, not quite constant. And in fact, if you put in um, the, if you look at the, the, the full um, 
result and you put in your approximations, and I'll let you do that, you would find that B is essentially related to A through a constant term where K1 is uh, very small compared to K2. So this is a very small number here. B is equal to a very small number times A. So it basically follows A, but at a very, very low level. And then you'd find that C, C rises up in approximately E to the minus K1 times T, so with rate constant K1. One minus one minus e to the minus k1 times the time. So the dominant rate is k1, and in this case here, this is an approximation that we're going to see again. We're going to revisit this approximation here. When we get to more complicated mechanisms, it's going to become the steady state approximation, where the amount of the intermediate, or the concentration of the intermediate, is low at all times and doesn't change very fast. So the slope here is very slow. Like because K1 is so slow coming down and B is related to A, which means it's related to this slow decrease in A, um, the amount of B is small and the rate of change of B is also very small. And hopefully we'll get to that very soon in this lecture. Okay, so that's a summary of what we did last time. Um, any questions? Okay, so the next thing now is to um, go to the next um, next mechanism, which is so far we've looked at reactions that proceed all the way. We haven't looked at equilibrium yet, but we know thermodynamics is all about equilibrium. And so now we're going to connect kinetics and thermodynamics. We're going to look at a, a mechanism which is a uh, an equilibrium mechanism. Equilibrium or reversible reactions. Where you have A goes to B with some rate constant K1, but you can have the reverse process, B goes back to A with the rate constant K minus 1. Or you can write it as A K1 K minus 1 to B where k1 could be k forward and k minus 1 could be k backwards. Right. Also written as k sub f, and this is also written as k sub b. So now we, we have more information that we had before, because now we know this is an equilibrium problem. And we already know about equilibrium from thermodynamics, and we know that at equilibrium, uh, in addition to all the rate laws that we're going to write down to solve the problem. We also know that at equilibrium, the equilibrium constant is related to the equilibrium concentrations, to the ratio of the equilibrium concentrations. This is something additional that we have. <coughs> okay, so let's write down everything we know, and our goal is to find out the time, the dynamics of this problem. Suppose you start at some time t equals zero with a certain amount of A naught in your pot, a certain amount of B naught, how do you get to equilibrium? What's the rate? What does it look like? So the first thing is to uh, write down the rates. So the forward rate minus dA dt, which is the forward rate, r sub forward is equal to k1 times a. And the backwards rate minus dB dt, which we can write as r sub backwards, that's k minus 1 times b. At equilibrium, we have no dynamics or no ensemble dynamics. The pot looks constant. It doesn't look like it's, anything's going on in there. The concentration of A doesn't change. The concentration of B doesn't change. They, they're constant at, at the equilibrium concentration. So that implies that the rate of formation of B must be equal to the rate of destruction of B. Or in other words, that the rate forward at equilibrium has to be equal to the rate backwards. Otherwise, there'd be changes in concentrations. So if that's true, then that means that at equilibrium, K1 A equilibrium has to be equal to K minus 1 
B equilibrium, which means that we can get this ratio of B to A and see that this is equal to K1 over K minus 1. So we've just, this is pretty major here, looks pretty simple, but we've just taken an equilibrium property here and related to uh, kinetics, to a rate property. So here we have kinetics, here we have thermo. Okay. All right. And this is going to turn out to be a, uh, the, uh, this kind of ratio between forward rates and backwards rates related to equilibrium constants is going to be valid, not just for this very simple mechanism we have here with just two species, but it's going to be valid for more complicated. When you have two species reacting to form another species or bimolecular stuff, et cetera. OK, so now we've, we've laid the groundwork. Let's look at the dynamics. Let's look at the time evolution. So that means that we need to take, uh, well, this is not quite right. I shouldn't write minus dA dt. Is, this is minus dA dt right forward in the absence of reverse process. Right? This is just the destruction of A and not the creation of A. So if you look at the full kinetics, the full mechanism. This also, the rate backward is minus dB dt in the absence of, the, of forming B back through the reverse process. So both of these are in, are in the absence of, of their reverse process. The full kinetics for the, uh, uh, for the destruction of A is the rate backwards, or the rate forwards, which is K1 times A, and then the rate backwards, which is the creation of A. It's the two rates together minus k minus 1 times b. There's the formation of a here. This is the destruction of a. This is the full differential equation for the full mechanism, not just one part of it. This one here is just for the first step, and that one here is for the second step. This is what we need to solve. But now we have a lot of, a lot of help by what we've already done. So what we can do is, uh, well, the problem here is that uh, it looks hard because there's B included in here. Right? This is not just A, there's B in here. But there's only two species, and stoichiometry is going to help us out. Remember last time or a few times ago we said the last species is the easy one because it's always related to the concentration of all the other species by stoichiometry. And the last one here is B. So we know that B is related to A. B is whatever you started out with plus whatever you used up for A. That's one way of writing it. So you start with this amount, and you create this amount by having A react. This is what you started with A, and this is what's left. The difference is, has to go into B. Okay? So stoichiometry gives you a relationship which you can use to plug in, into your, your differential equation here. And now, after rearranging your differential equation, putting B in there, you can rewrite this as K1 plus K minus 1 times A minus K minus 1 times B naught plus A naught. Okay, something which depends on A, something which is constant here. OK, what else do we know? We know something about equilibrium. We know something about when we reach a state where the rate forward is equal to the rate backward. When the rate forward is equal to the rate backwards, the rate of change of A is, const is 0. A is not changing. Concentration of A is not changing. So at equilibrium, dA dt is equal to 0. And just like in this example here, this is going to turn out to be related to an approximation called the steady state approximation, which we're going to see later to, uh, this morning. Writing at equilibrium that the change in the concentration of one of the species is equal to zero, 
We're going to use that as an approximation also later when we get to more complicated mechanisms. Right? This is going to be the equilibrium approximation, and this is going to be the steady state approximation. But let's keep going with our, we're solving this guy here. So at equilibrium, dA dt is equal to zero, and, and then we can replace our concentrations here. with, um, so if you write equal to zero here, then we can write this as equilibrium right here. And we'll, we'll, we'll be able to solve for A equilibrium in terms of K1, K minus one, uh, B naught and A naught. Okay, and then if you do that, you get A equilibrium is equal to K minus one over K1 plus K minus one times B naught plus A naught. We're going to need that. Because now we're going to be able to plug um, this. So there's A naught plus B naught sitting here. We're going to replace A naught plus B naught in terms of A equilibrium. There's a minus sign here. And um, between this A and, and this A equilibrium here. So by rewriting by plugging in A, B naught, A equilibrium instead of B naught plus A naught, we can rewrite that equation as D A D T is equal to K1 plus K minus one times A minus A equilibrium. This is nice because uh, this quantity, A minus A equilibrium, describes the, the difference between where you are and where you want to be. So this is a nice variable to have. It's going to change in time, and at infinite time, this is going to go to zero. A is going to go to equilibrium. A equilibrium is a, is a constant. Now we have a differential equation that relates A to this, to this difference, but A, is a constant, A equilibrium is a constant, so there's nothing that forbids us from just writing minus A equilibrium here, right? D of a constant dt is zero, so I'm just, basically subtracting zero here. So when I have something of the form dx dt is equal to constant times x, and I know how to write the, that, that looks just like a first order process, I know the solution is A minus A equilibrium is equal to my initial A, my initial state, A naught times E to the minus K1 plus K minus one times time. And I've solved the problem. I've described how, as a function of time, how A, the concentration of A gets to equilibrium. And if you want to know B, it's just the same thing. You replace B here and B naught here. You put K minus one here, K one here, but it's the same thing because it's the sum of the two. So if, if you were to sketch it out, of time, there's, eventually you'll get to the concentration of A equilibrium. If you're above it, you're going to decay in a first order fashion with a rate constant K1, A minus A equilibrium is A naught minus A equilibrium E to the minus K prime times T, where K prime is K1 plus K minus 1. And this is when A is greater than A naught, A equilibrium. A naught is greater than the equilibrium. And if you start below, you're going to come up like this. This is A naught is less than A equilibrium. And both rates come into here in a very simple way, just the sum of the two. So experimentally, if you want to find out these rates, um, you can measure the equilibrium concentrations. measure K equilibrium by obtaining the equilibrium concentrations of B and A. And that gives you the ratio K1 plus K minus one. And then you can just start the process with some concentration of A which is different than equilibrium. And then watching it in time, extract out, observe, uh, and measure K1 plus K minus one. 
in this kinetic equation, a kinetic relation, then you have two, uh, two results, two, two pieces of data. You measured k prime, which gives you the sum of the two, and you've measured k equilibrium, which gives you the ratio of the two. And you've got your two rate constants out. Okay, any questions for the equilibrium problem? We're slowly, yes? Um, there is not yet a relationship between k1 and k minus 1. Depends on the, uh, depends on the problem. Um, and we're going to study the, um, when we get to, uh, to uh, potential barriers, we'll look at, we'll, we'll look at, uh, at, at this issue. Okay, so it's a good question. We're going to do that probably next time. So let's keep going then with reversible reactions. So now we have, let's make it a little bit more complicated. Let's, instead of two species, let's make it three species. So we have A plus B goes to C with rate constant K1, and then C goes to A plus B with rate constant K minus one, which you can rewrite as A plus B goes to C, K1, K minus 1. And then you write down your, um, you want to solve this, so the first thing you do is you write down your differential equations, dA, dt is equal to, put all the rates in there, K1, AB minus K minus 1 times C. And at equilibrium, you set that equal to 0. So you can write equilibrium here, equilibrium here, equilibrium here. And um, when you bring this term over to the other side, you find then that at equilibrium, the ratio of the forward rate to the backward rates is equal to C equilibrium divided by A equilibrium, B equilibrium, which you know is the equilibrium constant. So again, for this slightly more complicated problem, the ratio of the forward and backward rates are related to the equilibrium constant. Okay. So now you want to solve this. Well, we're not even going to try because it's going to be too complicated. So as soon as you get away from first order kinetics and go to second order kinetics with multiple steps, it's a mess. So instead, you try to find approximations. In this case here, there's one we can use, or a limiting case at least. One we can use, which is an obvious one, which is flooding as a limiting case. If we want to isolate um, a small part of the problem, we can use flooding because we can overwhelm the system with either A or B. Take B not much greater than A not and C naught. So over the course of the reaction of the process, the concentration of B hardly changes. And so when we write our kinetic equation, our rate law, K1 A B minus K minus 1 C, well, we could put a little naught here because we know the concentration of B is not changing. And so now we're left with the problem we had before, which was a reversible first order process with, with which we have just solved. Okay, and then you go through the experiment and you extract out K1 times V naught and K minus one. You do the experiment again with a different concentration V naught to start out with and you can extract out K1. So this is a process of getting the rates by using a simple, a simple approximation here. Simple limiting case. All right, any questions? So we've just finished putting all the, all the building blocks together now. Okay, let me remind you what these building blocks are. We have a bunch of approximations under our belt, flooding. Uh, we've looked at, at rates being much faster than others. And we have three simple mechanisms 
We've looked at parallel reactions. We looked at series reactions. And we looked at reversible reactions. Okay. So a complicated mechanism will basically put these three building blocks together in a series. It'll be all be happening at the same time somehow. And obviously, since it was, since we threw up our hands just with a simple reversible process like here, it's clear that we're going to throw up our hands a lot when we write down these mechanisms. So we're going to need approximations. We're going to need something that we'll automatically go to and say, this is going to be too hard. I'm not even going to try. Let's do an approximation. Okay. And the two approximations that we're going to talk about are ones that I already mentioned at the beginning, which is the steady state approximation. When, when, where one rate, the rate to go into the, um, into the intermediate or, or is very slow, or the rate to get out of the intermediate is very fast. And the equilibrium approximation, where the system sets up a very fast equilibrium, and you're allowed to use thermodynamics then to help you out in solving the problem. These are the two approximations that we'll use when we put these things together. OK, so let's look at the first simple, more complicated mechanism to see where these approximations come in. So the first one is going to be a series. We're going to start putting these, these things together. The first one is a series reversible. Those two together. Series reversible. OK, so we have a first a reversible process. Everything is first order here. K minus 1 goes to B, and then B goes to C with some rate constant K2, all first order. If we were to turn the crank, we'd say, oh, I've got to write down all my rate laws here. Minus dA dt is all the ways that I destroy and create B. So uh, there's a, a K1 times A minus K minus 1 times B. dB dt, all the ways I create and destroy B is I can create it through destruction of A. I destroy it through the backwards rate to make it A. And I destroy it by making the product C as the intermediate. And then for C, that's pretty simple. There's only one channel into C. And that's the destruction of B to form C, K2. Okay. All the rate laws. I write everything I know here. Couple differential equations. We know it's going to be hard to solve. So let's remind ourselves of what I just erased, which was the case where the intermediate concentration was always very small, didn't change very fast, and the process was dominated by K1 here. That was a rate limiting step. Remember the, our, our first example this morning. OK. So this is where the concentration of B is roughly constant over time. It's small. And over any small time period, it's roughly constant. OK. Which means that dB dt is roughly equal to 0. If you look at a long term, obviously, it's going to change as you go from this point to that point. In fact, there's a relationship between A, which is changing in time, and B. But A is also changing in time very slowly because the rate, K1, is very small. So dP dt, which is related to this rate, K1, is going to be very slowly changing in time. We can approximate it to 0. What are the ways, in terms of matching these rate constants, that we can get to the approximation, to a diagram that looks, that looks like that. But we want, um, we don't want B to pile up. That means we have to have the rates out of the intermediate to be much faster, at least one of the rates out of the intermediate to be much faster than the rate that creates the intermediate. So the, the different ways of creating that approximation as if, are if, and the length of the arrows now is going to be proportional to the rate. Okay? We want it to be very hard to make B. And as soon as we make B, 
uh, we want it to go away. So one of the ways to do that is to have the reverse rate much faster than the initial rate. And we can have a slow rate into C, that's fine. We could have, again, a very slow rate into B. We could have a slow reverse rate and a fast rate into C. That's perfectly fine. We can have both fast rate out of B through A or out of B through C. As long as this first rate into B is small compared to one of those two rates, we're never going to pile at B. It's going to go away as soon as we make it. So in all these cases, K2 plus K minus 1 is much bigger than K1. Okay. When we have that, that situation, then we can make the approximation up here that the rate of change in B is very small, almost zero, which means it's basically a constant. And instead of writing B in this case here, we're going to write it as B steady state, which is basically a constant in terms of solving the differential equations. And that's going to make our life much easier because instead of having to solve these coupled differential equations, we're just going to have to solve coupled algebraic equations, which is really messy but less hard. It's, if you're a bean counter, then this is, you know, this is, this is heaven. Right. So now we're going to put steady state. This is going to be a constant, and this is going to be equal to zero. And then here, this is going to be steady state here. This is going to be steady state here. And the first thing to do now is that we've eliminated this differential equation. We now have an algebraic equation where we can solve for B steady state. Okay. So if you recognize that you're in this situation here, forget about trying to solve. Immediately go to the process of putting in a constant for B, setting db for the intermediate equal to 0, and then starting to turn the crank on the, on the algebra. Okay. So let me go ahead and turn the crank here, go through the steps, which is basically typical of these problems. And so you, cr you turn the crank, you solve for the steady state concentration you get in terms of A over K minus 1 plus K2. Then you plug this back in here, and you get a new differential equation, minus dA dt is equal to K1 times A minus K minus 1 times B steady state. So you plug this in here. And you get, so there's A sitting here, A sitting here. It's going to be of the form, an effective rate times A. It's going to be of, of basically a first order form, which is what we'd expect from writing, the, from sketching the diagram just like that. So you get minus dA dt is an effective rate, K1 times K2 over K1 plus K2 times A. This is K prime, OK? So if you were to do an experiment under these conditions, you'd find that A behaves, it's basically a pseudo first order problem okay, with, a, with a, funny, a funny rate that contains all the, rate, all the elementary rate constants as part of it. And when you do the same thing for C, B, C, D, T, you find that depends on A. It's K1, you plug B steady states in, in here, K1, K2 divided by K1 plus k2 times a. This is k prime again. So the problem, and it's first order, so the problem looks like effectively you're going from a to c, forget about the intermediate, with an effective rate k prime, where k prime contains these rates. OK, so this is, um, this is steady state approximation. It's the prototypical problem. Questions on steady state? Before we get to the next approximation. All right, so now, as promised, the next approximation is that where you set up a fast equilibrium and you can use thermo to help you out. Okay. 
equilibrium approximation. A goes to B. This is a fast process. And then K2 out of B is a slow process. Little arrow here and two big arrows here. So you put your A in your, in your flask. Immediately, you set up your equilibrium. And you slowly dribble out of that. If you want to do it as a function of, of buckets and, and uh, you have a big pipe connecting two buckets that are just offset from each other. So there's a, in this case here, B is favored over A because it's a little bit lower than this guy here. And then there's a little bucket, there's a little tube that comes out of here into C. So there's a little dribble into C over time. The first thing that happens is you set up your equilibrium, and then you slowly extract stuff through a little tube into C. So what do you expect this to look like? Well, you expect, um, you expect A to really slowly come out because the rate limiting step is the rate from B to C. So K2 is going to be the, the, the way that A is going to come out. Right? You expect it to slowly go away. You expect B to get created very fast to some equilibrium amount, and, and then also to follow the same rate K2, slow K2 to disappear. And you expect B, uh, C to uh, come up, basically in a first order process, to saturation at A0. So you expect the dominant rate to be K2 and the fast dynamics to happen at very, very early times, and then everything to follow first order kinetics. OK, so now let's do the math and make sure that it agrees with what we just assumed that it's going to look like. So equilibrium is happening. You can assume that at any time after the initial very fast process of getting equilibrium, so after some initial time, the ratio of B over A is always going to be a constant. The dribble out of B here is not going to be fast enough to, to change that ratio. As soon as you get a little bit of B out here, immediately, this, this is A here, immediately the, the ratios, the, the amounts rearrange to keep the ratio constant. So now when I look at the rate of the reaction, the rate of formation of C, K2 times B, well, in terms of A, it's K2 times K equilibrium times A, which is K2 times K1 over K minus 1 times A. And you can immediately see that C is behaving, or the reaction is behaving like a first order process with an effective rate which contains all three rates in this ratio here. So it looks like A goes to C with some K prime where this is K prime. It looks like A goes to C with an effective rate constant K prime. OK, questions? We're going to do some examples. And then we're going to do chain reactions next time. We're, we're one lecture behind. All right, let's do some reactions. The first, the, some. Uh, some uh, examples. I'm going to skip the first example, which is the, the um, example with the chaperone in the notes. And I'm going to go directly to the uh, gas decomposition. The two examples are basically very similar in their use of the steady state approximation. So I'll let you read over the first example. So this example here is, is going to give us the Lindemann mechanism for which Mr. Lindemann got a Nobel Prize many, many years ago. Basically, it's looking at uh, decomposition of a gas phase molecule. Where you have a molecule A that breaks down into products. And the observation. Uh, before Mr. Lindemann got around, was that 
it looked like a first order process. Okay? Looked like A is just falling apart on its own into these products. Mr. Lindemann got around and said, well, why would A just want to fall apart? You know, there's something a little bit odd about that. A stable molecule, why would it want to fall apart? And so he uh, hypothesized a mechanism that went, went like this. That A actually collides with another molecule which could be a, um, a bystander, could be a chaperone molecule that just happens to be there, or it could be another molecule of A. There's a collision. There's a collision that creates a vibrationally excited version of A. A is sitting there, it collides, and suddenly it starts to be really vibrationally excited. Bonds vibrate all over the place, atoms wiggle, and there's the collision partner that goes away. So kinetic energy is transferred from M and A to the vibrational modes of A in a process which is reversible. K1, K minus one, because this excited A, this vibrationally excited A could also collide with the molecule and, and cool down. The vibrations could be, the energy in the vibrations could be transferred back to kinetic energy through a reverse process. But if you wait long enough, or if, if this vibrationally excited A with these atoms wildly moving around, uh, that has more of a chance of falling apart than, than this guy here. So A star could fall apart into products with a ray K2. Right? So he said this is actually an important step. It's not that A just suddenly falls apart, but this has to happen. Okay? So all the observations that supported a first order process, which basically only supported one elementary reactions, might not be right. So let's assume his mechanism and let's look at, this, at what we need to do as an approximation and uh, where that leads us in terms of trying to experimentally <coughs> confirm that this mechanism is plausible. Not prove it, but just to make sure that it's consistent with, the data is consistent with the hypothesis. So let's compare our rates here. So we have a collision. A and M collide. And there's a certain probability uh, on the collision that, um, that kinetic energy will be transferred to vibrational energy. That turns out to be a moderate probability. So K1 is reasonably fast. The reverse process, you have something that's vibrationally excited, colliding with a molecule. There's a probability that that excitation is going to get turned back into kinetic energy, and then these two molecules will fly apart with high velocity. And that turns to be much high, more highly probable than the reverse process, than the first process. So this is faster. And then the excited molecules waiting around, and there's a probability that it's going to just fall apart. And that turns out to be really slow. Okay, so we're going to assume that the last step is a slow step. Okay, so what does it look like? Well, we have the creation is fast, of the intermediate is fast, but the destruction through the reverse process is much faster. We have at least one step out of the intermediate, which is faster than the step into the intermediate. That's all we care about. It doesn't really matter that this is slow in terms of using the steady state approximation. We just want the step getting out of the intermediate, the backward step in this case here, to be faster than the step into the intermediate. So this allows us, this fact that this is faster, that allows us to use a steady state approximation. Okay. So now we can go ahead and, and, and solve the problem. So we write down all the rates, minus dA dt, is K1 A, uh, rather the, the rate of the, rea let's, let's start with the rate of the action. Let's take a product, let's take C. Let's say this goes to uh, product C here. So DC DT is equal to K, K2 times A, that's the rate of the reaction. Okay. 
And we're going we're gonna to look at this rate of reaction and see how it changes, what it looks like under, certain, under limiting conditions, the rate of reaction. All right, and let's look at the intermediate. So this is what we're going to solve first because this is going to turn out to be an algebraic equation because we're going to apply the steady state approximations. Intermediate dA star dt is we can create it through the forward process. We destroy it through the backwards process, a star times m. And we destroy it through the final process, a star. We apply the steady state approximation, steady state, steady state. We solve for a steady state algebraically, k1 a m over m times k minus 1 plus k2. And then we plug that back into the rate of the reaction, the rate of appearance of C, which is what we're measuring experimentally. We're looking at the products, measuring the appearance of products, or so their destruction. This is also equal to the destruction of A. And so we plug this into the, we can write our rate of reaction. which we measure experimentally. We find this is K1 times K2 times, we plug in for uh, A here. What we do here, we solve A in terms of A steady state, right? A is equal to uh, something A steady state. Well, let's see, A is equal to um, K minus one plus K2 times, well, this is actually, I had this wrong up here. This is dA star. All right. So we don't need to do this here. The appearance of, the appearance of C is A star here. So we plug in um, A steady state here, A star steady state, and this is A star steady state here. The intermediate is, the, is what we're solving the steady state for. So this is k1, k2, a, m over m, k minus 1 plus k2. So we just have the extra k2 that appears when we multiply a steady state star with the k2 there. And then we can look at the, uh, the limiting cases. There are two limiting cases, which, which we can tell by looking at the denominator. We have one term bigger than the other. Only two choices here. So the first case is where m k minus 1 is much bigger than k2. Okay. Experimentally, what does that mean? It means that this is in the gas phase now. It means that regardless of what the, these rates are here, we've managed to make the concentration of m high enough so that this becomes true. Okay. There's always an m that's going to be high enough so that the multiplication of these two is going to be bigger than that. What does it mean? It means that the pressure is high. Concentration of M is high. This is a high pressure, high pressure case. And then the other one is M K minus one is much less than K two. M is very small, low concentration, low pressure. The partial pressure of M is very low, and uh, this could be A. M could be A, or it could be some other molecule that's in the mix. And by high pressure, we mean something on the order of one bar, let's say. And by low pressure, we mean something on the order of 10 to the minus 4 bar. OK, so now we can go and put these limiting cases in our, our, our equation here. k minus 1 is much bigger than k2, so we can ignore k2 here. And then we have something that looks like the m's disappear. We have something that looks like k1, k2 over k over k minus 1 times a is the rate of reaction. Okay, First order. Looks like it's first order in a. This is what people had observed. Great. The problem is that they didn't know to go to low, low pressure. They were doing all their experiments at atmospheric pressure. They were getting a first order rate. They, were, they thought they had solved the problem. It's just a falling apart by itself. Until you go to low pressure, where now this term dominates the denominator, 
Rather, this one dominates the denominator. And now you have uh, something of the form um, K1A times M. This dominates, this term goes away. The, twos goes, the K2 goes away. You have K1 times A times M left over as the rate of the reaction. Second order, there are two species here, A times M. M could be A or it could be some chaperone. It could be A squared, second order process. So if you're at low pressure, you see something at second order. You've discovered something about the mechanism you didn't expect, and then you get a Nobel Prize. All right, next time we'll do chain reactions.